<clears throat> so I'm going to give you kind of a big, like a big overview, and then, and then we'll drill down into the brain stuff. What's going on with a person's brain? So we're going to go from concept to forty thousand neurons on the head of a pin. <laughs> okay, so there's so I'm going to just do some necessary ingredients here, um, and. And I, too many years in the restaurant kitchen, but ingredients, I like to do that. Hey. You know? I still have scars, you know. Mm. Let's see, capacity. Uh, can you implement it? Can you sustain it? And then evaluate every once in a while. So, but we really want to know why we're here, what's our purpose in doing whatever, whoever we are, and then what do we want to look like down the road? And people will mess with this, you know. They'll call it, they'll combine these and call them purpose, whatever, and that's okay. It doesn't really matter. But, but being clear about what we're, what we're doing, because if we don't, everybody will bring in their own version. Hence, we'll have some we'll have some serious conflict. So, if Sean and I, are, he believes we're here for purpose A, and I believe we're here for purpose B, is our strategy going to look weird, right? So, the how-to of what we're going to do is going to get messed up. We'll have conflict. And boom! All of a sudden, we so clarity about this stuff. Why are we here? What do we want to look like? And how are we going to pull it off? How are we going to realize the vision, fulfill the mission? And then, do we have the capacity to do it? Do we have the time, money, skill sets, uh, or whatever other resources, facility, location, all that kind of stuff? And then can we implement it? It's informed. Then can we implement it? And, uh, hi. She's ready to morph. Ready to morph. Yeah, you're going to be changed. <laughs> Change must come from within. That's an old hot dog joke. But anyway, so can you implement it? And uh, there's a book called Execute or Die. Uh, Ex CEO of Honeywell talks about a bunch of good ideas out there. Can you make it happen? And if you can make it happen, if you can implement it, can you sustain it over the long term? Because you can't sustain it, you're not going to realize your vision, you're not going to fulfill your mission. Make sense? Yeah. And then every once in a while, evaluate where you're going with this stuff. So, um, <clears throat> you guys know about forming, storming, norming? Performing? Yeah. I talked to a group of 48 HR people. Eight of them raised their hands when I asked what they knew about phone. I know, it was jaw drop time. It was like, if anybody should know this stuff, it's HR guys, right? Yeah. Anyway, so um, then I'm just going to put, I've got to get a depth with these fancy pins here. So forming, in a form. Do you guys know about forming, storming, norming? Okay, so this is a typical group process. We all get together because we're a bunch of good people here for a good or noble cause, okay? Eventually, the differences emerge that cause us to question other people's motivations, our own, are we doing this the right way, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times that's unspoken. And Ken Cloak said, nothing you say is as powerful as what you think and don't say. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. Okay. So if we can get through the storming phase, we can get some norms. And by norms, I mean socially acceptable behaviors in our group. And so inner city gangs have their norms. Boy Scouts have their norms. Um, a group of, any group of people establishes norms. Churches have norms. Um, and then if we can get functional norms here, we can get to some performing. Okay. That's kind of the stages that groups go through. Now, Every organization has some kind of bottom line results. Correct? I mean, student retention rates here, dollars, whatever it might be. So, And 
And in order to get those bottom line results, what do you suppose we need? Wait, measure. Measure. No, no. Okay. Plan. Plan. Vision. Mm-hmm. And generally speaking, what we need is some action to produce a result. So we can call that productivity. Um, what and we want some kind of focused action because we don't just want a bunch of activities going on. <laughs> Can't be flipping hamburgers hoping for higher student retention rates, for instance. Yeah. We need to have this. In order to get that focused action, what do you suppose we need? Leader. <laughs> we'll use a term that was a big buzzword a few years ago called high performance teams, implying that they're getting the maximum action out of minimum effort kind of a thing, so high performance, right? And do you suppose, let me put this down here, I guess, um, in order to foster those environment high performance teams we need a positive or a negative work environment positive, positive no brainer right okay, we want it. okay so the question becomes then how do we get that positive work environment and this is wherein I bring in my little triangle which I've come to call a, a foundation for collaboration that um, just like a house, you're not going to build a second story first, you know, or put the walls up without a foundation, right? And so this foundation consists of, I've come to call this, I'm going to acronym you again here, Sean, but uh, interpersonal performance standards. In other words, how do I interact with Jim Jolly if we're doing a project? What kind of... Um, voice tones even, what kind of respect do I show, all those kinds of things, how much trust do we have with each other, because if you have low levels of trust, you don't have high performance teams. Okay. Yeah, so, and I love the term performance, because now it's a performance. It's something you do, like hammering a nail, but it's how you're interacting with other folks. And it's observable. Yeah, and it's observable, and they're behavioral terms. So I have, actually have worksheets for this with prompts on it, so you can fill it out and say, and the group fills it out, is, is a beautiful thing. Instead of the boss going, hey guys, here's your interpersonal performance standards. The group can, creates a huge piece, because if you want to implement any kind of change, your best possible shot, not a guarantee, is to include the people that are impacted by it. So that can be vendors, as well as employees, as well as customers, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the group does this work. And then, um, want to have a conflict management system? Because if you don't manage, conflict is inevitable. It'll occur, we're all different. Those differences are going to clash at some point in time. Yeah? So, because if you don't manage conflict, conflict will manage you. Like trolls making babies under the bridge. When they do come out, it's going to be ugly. <laughs> okay. So, then the other piece I put in here is have a, some way to run your meetings. This MMM is meeting management model. But some way so that you get in and out, in an hour, or whatever your allotted time is, with, with action items, with people following through, with people feeling good about what's going on, instead of being frustrated, bored, overwhelmed, or whatever, which the national data shows that at least 50% of time in meetings is wasted. So have a lean strategy around um, how you run your meetings, you know. So I actually did this as a tool um, for my thesis project, as an intervention with a community action group in Moses Lake. They have been traditionally taking three hours to get a 90-minute meeting done. So I introduced the meeting management model, sat down with them, and I f modeled the facilitation part of it on the first meeting. They were done in 90 minutes. And the reaction was shock. They couldn't believe it. But it was just keeping off task behaviors out of the room. What, what are we focused on? What's our purpose for the meeting? All that stuff. Anyway, so now, 
one of the things that um, I've come up with is that what we really do if we have agreements here, and I have worksheets for this too, so the groups that sound, they have a framework within which to operate. They choose what the roles are going to be, how they're going to construct their agenda, all that kind of stuff. So there's worksheets. The only thing I don't have a worksheet for is this, because I've been tweaking it for about 15 years. And so I say, <laughs> and I'm still <laughs> proving it. <laughs> there is, it's never done, right? So I just say, hey, adopt this if you will. Can you agree to adopt this? You can always revise it later, but let's don't take the time now to dig into all the complexities and all this stuff. I also use this conflict management system as more as a, it's like a policy, but it's a one sheet training tool. So just go down through the um, training tool and train that stuff. Okay, now, um, so here's the cool part. So if we're going through forming, storming, norming, we're a bunch of good people here for a good and noble cause, and I'll tell you a story. I'm sitting with 18 mediators as a group. We interviewed them ahead of time, and they had about 12 different versions of why they were there and what they wanted to look like. And so, and they wanted to do a strategic plan. So Kay Holland was the last master facilitator instructor from Wazoo. She and I went down there and it took us five hours to convince them that without clarity here, they weren't going to come up with a strategic plan. Want a bunch of good people? They're for a good or noble cause? Absolutely, right? Didn't work. <laughs> so that's the myth I'm busting. Just because we're a bunch of good people, here for a good or noble cause, everything should work out right. So that's the myth I'm busting. Now, here's the cool part. We go create these, and we have the, the people that are impacted by it, employees, stakeholders, whoever they are, create these, what this becomes as a foundation for collaboration, right, is um, our norms. So what we've done is we've, ahead of time, can I shut this down? Yeah. Um, so what we've done is Great. These are our norms now. This is how we manage conflict when conflict does occur as well. These are interpersonal performance standards. This is how we're going to act with each other. And we all agree to this. Okay? And this is how we're going to run our meetings. Okay? So these can be our norms now because the big deal here is that any change, any change takes the group back to the forming stage. So new employee, employee gets laid off, it's not replaced, budget cuts, any kind of change. The more complex the change, the harder it is to get back up here. The simpler the change, the easier it is to get back up here, but simple changes can mess groups up big time. Just simple changes. We're taking four hours off that person's time. They're not gonna work half time. It can be huge. How does it get spread out? And if there isn't role clarity about what happens, now we've got role ambiguity which is uncertainty, which is fear, which is, now we've got a fear-driven culture in the group, okay? So here's the cool part. Because we've set this up, we know where we're going with the norms. We're not gonna be a bunch of good people here for a good or noble cause and somehow accidentally get through this and come out with highly functioning norms. No, we know where we're going because this is in place. Does that make sense? So we're not stumbling and going and thinking and wishing and hoping and Sounds like a song. <laughs> but, uh, so we know exactly where we're going. Okay. Now let's say you have an already established group. So Jim and I and Joan and Kenny, all you guys are working with me. We're an established group, and we lose Kenny. Okay. And we get a new person in. <clears throat> this is still has still been constructed by the group of people, and norms drive your culture. So is it a fear-driven culture? Is it a positive culture? Are we supporting each other? Are we offering help, asking for help, maintaining composure in a challenging situation, open and honest collaboration, respect, trust, all that stuff, right? Is, um, <coughs> is what our norms are. New person comes in, Sean gets hired. So what we do is we orientate him around what the group has decided upon. Tell him he can <coughs> give us his input if he has some kind of improvements. 
yeah, in a couple of months, once he's in there, and ask him to agree, we can actually have him sign this and date it, and agree that this, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with this is how we all said we'd act together, and I, I'll go along with that, okay? Now, here's the cool part, is that if Sean violates that, now we have an opportunity for coaching. And the premise behind coaching is, is that you're asking questions to get to the intrinsic motivation that you want your employee to engage in. Okay? So, so just because Sean violated one of our norms here, doesn't mean he's a bad person. We see him down and say, hey, this happened. Um, remember when you signed the agreement, you now have a reference piece? It isn't something out in the air that we're supposed to be nice to each other. No, we've articulated in behavioral terms on a piece of paper that you read and signed and said, I can live by this. Right, Sean? Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> anyway, so now we can coach, right? Now, if the person violates it again, so. There's, well, let's, well, you set your, <laughs> you're out of here. That's the next one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't want to have a policy. Is it three times of a violation of, you know, whatever that is, you clear, make clear what that is. But if they set a pattern of violating these things, Sean is always losing it uh, in a challenging situation, not maintaining composure, and then we got to let him go, okay? Because, Here's my hard case for soft skills. We want this positive work environment so we can get high performance teams, so we can get focused action, so we can get optimum bottom line results. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it isn't, be, it isn't that Sean is good or bad. It's his behaviors are not acceptable because they're tainting our positive work environment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and we got to call it. Because if he gets away with this, if he loses it and snaps at Heather one day and then does it again and nobody calls him on it, guess what? We now have a new norm called, I can snap at somebody and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And what does that do to our positive work environment? It taints it once again, right? That makes sense? Now, here's, here's where the, can I erase this yep. stuff here? We don't have any more bottom line results. We don't go home. <laughs> so, here's what ha here's what's happening with the brain science stuff. Are you guys familiar with emotional contagion? You know, so it's like people getting the giggles, or somebody walks in the room in a bad mood and everybody goes whoa, or somebody walks in the room in a good mood and everybody goes hey, what's going on? Kind of that's the emotional contagion. Lynn Fouquet says it's the most proven thing in brain science is that emotional contagion stuff. So, if we want to believe Lynn, and I do, so we've got our five people coming in here, and first of all, these aren't horns, by the way. These are big bags. So, by the time we're 35, 95% of what we do is automatic. We just react, okay? <coughs> now, and that was probably created back when we were six months or one or two or three or four or whatever. And it worked for us then because our brain is wired to survive. And it'll make things up about how to survive in a situation where we feel like we're being threatened. And we're always threatened. Our brain scans for threat five times a second. Isn't that crazy? What is that? Five scans times a second. Scan for threat. Scan, scan, scan for threat. And so oh, that's wow. what kept us alive in the jungles and was that a bluebird or a saber-toothed tiger in the bush? We want to make sure it's, oh, it's just a bluebird, we're okay. But we're always scanning for threat, making sure we're safe, making sure we survive. So consequently, you accumulate a lot of belief systems about how things are supposed to be, accumulate a lot of um, habitual emotional responses to situations, to people. Um, my dad was a big scary guy. He was scaring people at 90 years of age in church, grown men. Okay? Yeah, so 
this is the guy I grew up with. Consequently, whenever I saw a, a male with a scowl, it was a fight or flight. Yeah, but that's just that's an example, right? And there's just a million examples of what we're all bringing. So we're all bringing all kinds of belief systems, values, um, habitual emotional responses to stuff, um, and we all do it. It's all been wired from. Um, from uh, trying to serve your brain, making, your, making sure you survive. Anyway, enough graphics, you guys. Okay. So, when you get people in a room, we've got five people that are wor we're working with here, right? And everybody's bringing a different version of how things are supposed to be belief systems, these are wired in. This is absolutely true that this is right, right? And the whole right or wrong thing, all well, it should or shouldn't be, it's supposed to be this way, it's true or false, happening because I can fix this. Everybody's bringing a different batch of stuff, okay? So we go back to the emotional contagion stuff. What we've got is a room full of five people with all of their baggage, okay? So what we're doing by creating this stuff here and saying, you know what? We've got boundaries. And in these boundaries is all this stuff here. How we're going to act with each other, how we're going to manage conflict, how we run our meetings. Oh, by the way, communication is, is throughout this whole thing, like thread in a fabric, right? Um, so what this does is saying, this stuff here, if it doesn't fit into here, we don't bring it in the room. And that's what this agreement is saying. Okay? Say please, thank you, and I'm sorry. What a concept. Pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so all these, this is boundaries for people's um, ineffective responses. Now, not to say that everything is wired in. It's bad, right? I mean, right. walking is wired in. We learned how to do that when we were one or so. <laughs> fall, stand up, cry, whatever. Finally, you get. So we don't have to learn how to walk every day. <laughs> you know, right? So some automatic responses are desirable. It's the ones that don't work for us in our organization to achieve our bottom line results and creating high performance teams to do that. Okay. So now we've set. We've asked people to keep this stuff out of the room, and for no other reason than emotional contagion. So if you're walking around with resentment, regret, self-criticism, disappointment, discourage, all that kind of stuff is negative, negative influences in our work environment. And we don't want that, right? Why? Because we want that positive work environment to foster high performance teams, to get us high performance focused action, to get us better bottom line results. Yeah? And so it's not that Sean is good or bad. It's that he's throwing stumbling blocks in the way of our people getting the work done in an optimum manner. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy? Still looks like we got to get rid of shock. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just tear down the model. Yeah. So, um, I can't put the triangle in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the triangle kind of in the middle. So yeah. You get that. Yeah. Yeah. Any comments or questions or did pop up at any time? Um, and you know, and what, here's the cool part: the further I go, the more I read and study about brain research um, and stuff. Is like it's more and more validating this, more and more. Oh, and by the way, I have a real good validator called my classroom. Because I tell my students, so I've run this stuff by close to 2,000 students now, if not more. Um, and so I say, look, guys, pragmatism is one of my core values. I want stuff that works. So I go out and find what I think is the best possible thing that might help you all. This is Social 125, employee-employer roles in the workplace, right? So how are they going to act in the workplace? So I go out and find stuff. I think it's really good stuff. So I run it through my, um, my screen, okay? And then I tell them, you guys tell me if this doesn't make any sense. 
If this isn't making any sense to you, either I'm not communicating it well, or something's faulty with theory here. So challenge me. And I tell them that throughout the quarter, challenge me if this doesn't make any sense. I can be wrong, right? <laughs> As most of us can be. So anyway, so I'm running through this my couple thousand students as a filter. So I feel like I've got some pretty good validity around. And it just resonates with people mostly. It just makes sense, yeah? So, um, what else? Well, I know. So I've seen your presentation on the uh, management model. But, uh, so there's some depth to each one of those. That yeah. Those yeah. corners. That absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That, thanks, Sean. I mean, that makes... So yeah. yeah, if you take conflict management, do we come in with some kind of set belief about how to deal with conflict, mm -hmm. fight, flee, rationalize, Bully. you know, yeah, bullying, mm -hmm. dominance, absolutely. Same thing with meetings. So again, we've, we've set some parameters about off-task behaviors in our meetings. So if somebody wants to dominate the situation, somebody wants to tell a war story that's off the agenda, somebody wants to come up with a good idea, we have boundaries around this stuff that allows the group to stay on track. So I use the, uh, the meeting management stuff. So we're asking people to set aside their tendencies to sidebar, their need to dominate the conversation to show they're right. We're asking people to do that. And again, we've got a worksheet. The people that are in the meeting themselves all create how they want to run their meetings. So when everybody has a role, so we don't have role ambiguity, so we have a facilitator that stays neutral to the content. We have a recorder who captures action items with deadline dates and owners. We have a timer that says, hey, you got five minutes left. And we have members who support the process. Can you guys all agree to that? And of course, everybody says yes, right? Then when somebody violates that, we just point to what the group said they wanted. So now the facilitator is empowered, right? Facilitator doesn't have to be a bad guy. Beat people with a stick to keep them on the ship here kind of thing, right? You say, hey, you guys remember when you guys said sidebar conversations were not a good idea. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back on track. Yeah. So, anything else about this? Yeah. It's not even on the board. You did mention it, but it seems like communication is so involved oh. in this thing. It's like it covers covers the whole ability. If I can't let you know that I'm having some reservations about the discussion or where it's going, mm -hmm. if I don't feel comfortable in sharing that, mm -hmm. and I just harbor resentment or start to back away from the group, uh, I can become a Sean mm -hmm. very easily and, mm -hmm. and then have to be Absolutely. coached yeah. when the whole problem was a communication issue in the beginning. Yeah. Not seeing how we can really make that so key because these groups may be on different campuses or different mm -hmm. physical locations and our communication may be solely email or mm -hmm. texting or whatever it is mm -hmm. in person. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you all know the 93%, 7% thing with communication. So 58% 58 community. And this is done in a couple studies in LA, uh, Southern California somewhere, but 60,000 people apiece. And these aren't cast in stone, but 58% is simply what you look like in your body language. Mm -hmm. How your face is moving, whether you're smiling or got a crooked grin or, you know, better than that. 58% is that. 35% is uh, the nonverbals, the, here's a name for them, but the, the tone of your voice, the pace of your words, pitch, inflection is huge, all that kind of stuff. Body okay. language. And 7% is content. So texting, emails, those kinds of things, when it's content only, you have a 93% chance of messing up. That's why email etiquette is very important. So yeah, we want to have a communication understanding. And one of the things we're going to do with our folks is send them through a communication training showing exactly why communication is this difficult. Right? Because whenever I'm listening to this person here, I got all this chatter going on. Yeah. This guy, watch a guy named John Weir. He talks about bodily sensations as a base that um, we respond with some kind of level of 
anxiety, intensity, learning, and four or five other terms. That creates, um, that's then filtered through how much education we have, what kind of culture we live in, a laundry list of 19 other things, creates, he calls it a percept screen. That you are constructing this screen, and we all know this, right? this guy just took it and <laughs> unraveled it crazily, right? This screen, if we're making stuff up to, f to match what our screen says, yeah? So I'm making stuff up when, that's what, what words mean, exercise. Um, words Can Change Your Brain is a book put out by Wahlberg and Newman, a couple of brain science guys, a bunch of brain research. Every word means something different to every person. Like, whoa. Depending on their frame of reference. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I run my students through a little what words mean exercise. I put everybody, nobody, always, and never. <laughs> and have you seen that? <laughs> yeah, so it's, tell me the percentage of people, if you, if you hear the word everybody, is it 100%, 90, 80, what is it for you? Same thing with nobody, always and never, right? And some people get confused, and I say, just work with it, work with me here because this works. So what happens is you get everybody, and there'll be 50% up there, 70, 80, 90%, same thing with nobody. People say zero, some people say 15, 25, etc. on and on, right? So they get to see that if I say the word nobody, it means something different. <laughs> the other thing about those words, by the way, is that they're inflammatory. Because they're extremes. Because they're extremes, yeah. Absolutely. You never take out the garbage. Never. <laughs> Everybody knows that Coke is better true. than Pepsi. <laughs> anyway, but then I ask them, I say, well, what does the word uh, integrity mean to you? And I'll get six different definitions. Said, what does the word failure mean? And I'll get five or six different definitions. Most of them negative. The definition of the word failure is not a negative definition. It didn't work, right? But there's a negative connotation to it now in our, in our culture, especially because of the media. That guy's a failure. Anyway, so, did I beat this up enough? Yeah. Sorry, I just have one quick question. And I Make it quick, buddy. Late, so I didn't get some of that early context, but how do you um, deal with, particularly with diverse groups, where people, like, you know, you got your graphic up there, the reds and the blues, people bring stuff to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot, you know, there's a lot of, like, you, like you're suggesting, a lot of communication that happens non-verbally and so on, and people have their histories that they're bringing. Mm -hmm. um, but to what extent are, are members of the team responsible for at least having some awareness of um, let's say, um, issues around race. Yeah, absolutely. And well, what people bring to the table yeah. with that. Yeah, so a couple things. One is, the more diversity you have, the more potential for conflict you have. And I run my students, cultural diversity is easy to see, in a lot of sense, you know, skin color, race, ethnicity, all that kind of stuff. It's the below the surface stuff mm -hmm. that you don't see. It's that tip of the iceberg, below the, here, I'll be, mm -hmm. Okay, so if you've got a, what you can see in here is visible, right? Which is the other thing I love about this stuff is you're all you're just talking about what you can see in here. Mm -hmm. There's no question about intention or motivation or why you did this and that kind of stuff. Under here is all the emotions, thoughts, um, and belief systems, which I've shortened to BS. <laughs> thought you'd like that. Um, but this is all driving these thoughts and behaviors, mm -hmm. right? So again, so the other point, Kenny, is that this is a foundation for collaboration. So on top of this, we start doing diversity training. The diversity training I do is what's the diversity that's underneath the surface? That's your Myers-Briggs types, P versus J's, okay? That's people who uh, have different emotional strengths and weaknesses. All that kind of stuff is, is under here. If we can access that, and usually you can do that through coaching by access, asking questions, and we can access this. But what we want to do is train this stuff. We want, on top of this foundation, train communication skills. Have practices, role play, 
Train uh, conflict resolution skills on an individual basis. And by the way, that's one of the things I see as a problem with conflict resolution skills. We'll give you and you conflict resolution skills and good luck. You got the culture to contend with, right? What is everybody else doing? Um, I have a few stories about people who go into a workplace, refuse to gossip, because that if you refuse to buy into the norms, you'll get ostracized. Okay? So, in, in the inner city gangs, they may kill you, put you in a bathtub full of gasoline and set it on fire. At Enron, you just got fired. Anybody watch uh, Brightest Men in the Room? Room? Yeah, the CFO stands up says, guys, we're doing something bad here. We gotta stop it. Some way, shape, or form. Next day he's fired. Next day he's gone. He didn't buy into the norms. Yeah. So yeah, so on top of this, yeah, teamwork, team building skills, communication skills, diversity skill, whether it's cultural or um, style diversity is what I call it. So I have my students dig into this. I've got a big old graph with Myers-Briggs, learning style, Strength Finders 2.0, Emotional Intelligence 2.0, five people, what are they all bringing into the table, or into the room, right? And a big table of all those differences. Now, the homework exercise is, how is this going to be a complement to this team? How are they going to, how are these differences going to promote, that's the promise of diversity, right? Better ideas, better production, better innovation, and question number two, what's the potential for conflict here? And question number three is how are you going to compensate for that conflict? So one of the things I have is a conflict management system. This is our policy. Okay? We have some communication tips. I have a one sheet on communication tips I've taken from five different sources. This is how we communicate well. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Covey. Clarify what your intention is and or is not. Crucial conversations, um, and but you know a bunch of stuff like that. This is how, because that's a that's an antidote for that 93. This thing here, right, is having some communication skills. So yeah, and so distance makes a difference. Absolutely, if you're doing text and emails, that makes a difference in communication. But train that stuff on top of this foundation. But get the foundation first. You're not going to put the second story bathroom without a foundation, yeah? Anyway, this makes sense? Okay, speaking of which, I gotta go meet with Carl Bruner, Mount Vernon Soup, right? Um, and we're gonna talk about, he wants to do something around ethnic diversity in the community. Speaking of which, and so we're going to be talking to him. I'm going out with the Dispute Resolution Center, Resolution Center uh, director, and talking about the need for conflict management. And we're just going to doing like a needs assessment. We're talking to court people, chamber people, EDASC, um, those kind of, and different um, industries and so on uh, about how do we manage conflict. Anyway, so you can do that today. Pardon? Is that today? Yeah, that's why I had to come in early. I got to be there at eleven. That's why I got why well, I got my eye on the clock. So just make oh one last thing, right? This little that's a phone call because you got voice tone, pitch, word pace, all those kinds of things. Say something in your dead silence on the other end of the phone, <laughs> telling you a lot. Of course, it's all this stuff interpreting it, right? Yeah. Okay. So, again, yeah, please pop up with questions at any time. It helps me. Do you have any good information on emails? Because I, I, I've got to. I read emails and I'm like, is it yeah. a thank you or is it thank you? Like, do this, thank you. Or is that, yeah, I'm trying, like, it's what I'm trying to say, like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but it might be like, well, thank you, better do this now, you know? I'm you mean like, email, email you? Yeah. And email etiquette? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a sheet. Uh, email shown. You, you guys want to see the email etiquette? Email yeah, etiquette please. to these guys. Okay. I'll email it to you. And you can email everybody. Okay. Probably got to do it campus wide. Huh? Yeah. Well, it's yeah. huge source. Huge or is source. That, right? is that rude? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's Sean's emails. That's right. Yeah. Sean's no, I had, on in my master's class, I had this gal come up to me and she said, "Look at this email." 
Can you see what she's trying to do? Can you see? I'm going, looks like information to me. But she hit because of her screen, right? She had put so much meaning into it. Anyway. Yeah. So. Well, Dwayne's pretty big. You got that going until November. Maybe after November, we can run through some of these others. What's that? The, the oh, the angel? The management and the coaching with Brandon. Yeah, after yeah. you're done with the angel. Only. Yeah. So yeah, the, well, the, yeah. Yeah, I got to do a bunch of gigs out of Angel of the Winds covering exactly this stuff. You guys want to know this thing here, and this is at the heart of coaching. Uh, every one of us scans to make sure that these things are not threatened. The scarf model. David Rock was a uh, is a business coach and got interested in um, brain science what was going on with it around now he's holding global neuro summits with top leading brain brain guys from around the world so if in coaching one of the reasons for the emphasis on uh, well here let me give you this uh, coaching is really an effort to take uh, potential uh, lose interference, interference in order to get performance. That's like a bedrock of, of coaching in the business world. In the baseball world, you stand like this, put your foot like that. You don't tell people stuff because telling people stuff sends them to threat. And asking questions sends them to reward. So every interaction, we're scanning to make sure our status isn't threatened. Because we're still in the amygdala, we're still living in caves and stuff, right? So if our status is threatened, that's food, shelter, and clothing for me or my family, right? Same thing with certainty. Certainty, lack of certainty produces fear. And fear can produce all kinds of negative behaviors, right? Autonomy, do I have control over what, how I get to live my life, do my stuff, right? If that's threatened, I know in, intuitively, I just, I was always scared of that. Uh, bosses taking away my autonomy, especially working in restaurant kitchens, telling me how to do stuff. Like, get out of here. I have knives and fire and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then relatedness, one of the biggest deals in, and with human beings is having that connection. We want to be connected, with, we need to be connected with other people. Mm -hmm. There's a great uh, video on mirror neurons. If you guys want it, I'll, I'll, um, I'll ship it to you. Mm -hmm. But it's a little 22 minute video and the guy is showing through send that neurons into consciousness video off as well. Uh, showing through brain science how we are all connected. We are all, Albert Einstein, the greatest illusion is that we're separate from one another. He's showing through brain science how we are, this is one energy field. We are interacting with each other all the time, period. Which brings us back to that work environment. What are we bringing into the room around our connectedness? With, well, is it distrust, resentment, uh, disregard, you know, da 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 da. Anyway. So I thought I'd show you that. And then here's a little, uh, this is a emotional intelligence improvement model. And again, I created this with the help of my students. Summer of 010, I think it was. Um, and David Rock did this, and he had it in like a mathematical formula like EXP squared and then some parentheses and, and over one, blah, 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 blah. So I took my students and I said, let's make this so that somebody can read this, can follow it and use it. So what it looks like is, if you can, and I do this as a homework assignment as well. I have them do this three times. Because this is theory. Unless you go out and put it to work on the street, it's pretty much useless. So application is really what I'm after with the homework assignments. So you get a stimulus, 
Um, and so it can be anything, right? And you get a habitual, so if you want it ahead of time, think of a situation where you get this stimulus and you have an emotional, habitual emotional response. And these can be small things, right? Although, the example I like to use is the guy going 35 and a 50 from Burlington to Woolley. You know, you want to fly up there and shoot his tires out or something. So, but we can't do that. So if you can, uh, with this habitual emotional response, if you can notice and name it, and this, is the, this is the key skill set here, then you can set this aside. If you can do all that, you can choose new thinking. Um, here I'm going to acronym you again, Sean. Uh, put a lot of positive attention density to it. Positive attention density. Positive attention density. That's the term David Rock uses again, but. Um, basically what's going on here so this is your neural these are neural networks right wired in had it for a long time if you can note instead of being gripped by that feeling of impatience and irritation with the guy going from burlington to woolly instead of being gripped by that if i can notice and name it now i'm the observer now that the, they're calling that metacognition you can think about your thinking you go what thoughts feelings and behaviors are going on here Oh, that's impatience and irritation. And there's thoughts going, the guy's an idiot, doesn't know how to drive, I'm better than him, well, I'm gonna invalidate him, justify me, all kinds of stuff. But if you can notice the name of what happens is you, that you send that information to the prefrontal cortex, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. It's the only brain term I can say really well. So <laughs> like really well. Okay. But it lights up your prefrontal cortex, part of your prefrontal cortex, and tends to dampen down the fight, flight, or freeze. So when your fight, flight, or freeze lights up, it tends to dampen down your prefrontal cortex. Ever been so mad you couldn't speak? Anybody had that experience? Yeah, well, yeah. a lot of times I'll get people, but yeah, your, your ability to, to rationalize and think and be logical is, is dampened down, clouded over, if you will, okay? So if you can notice and name this, light up the prefrontal cortex, if you can set this aside, you can then choose new thinking, okay? Now you want to do this ahead of time, so, oh, this guy's going to go 35 and 40 in front of me, and 50 in front of me. I know this is going to happen. That's going to be my stimulus. My habitual emotional response is to get impatient and irritated, okay? But I can notice, oh, that's impatience coming up. Let me set that aside, and how about if I think about being patient and generous instead? So if you don't, whatever doesn't fire together, unwires. You don't use it, you lose it. Whatever does fire together wires. The more you use it, the more you, the more it wires in. Yeah. So, and that's why I put repetitions or the mom of skill because you can't just do this once and be on the stained glass windows in church. Is that, make, is that fun? So I actually had a friend of mine. A uh, longtime school teacher and and mediator here, and she had been rear-ended twice, to the point where she almost fractured her neck. I was so I was going through all kinds of, and she's I was showing her this, and she's she's I get so scared in traffic anymore. She's just grip, you know. And there's a fine line between awareness and paranoia. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so I well, so I went through this with her, and she says, "Well, I, I can get this part." She said, but I don't know what to do here. Well, I said, well, let's play with it a little bit. So she, what she ended up coming up with was she was gonna, I was telling her about being on the Sheriff's Reserve in Chelan. It took me about 20 years to quit going Adam Bravo Charlie 1239 er You know, when I'm looking at a license plate, it's going through my head, right? <laughs> Stop! <laughs> anyway, so she said, well, huh, that sounds like fun. I'll make my own phonetic alphabet. And when I'm in front of a car, my new thinking will be, I'll see what kind of car it is, and then see what the license plate is, and make it my own phonetic alphabet. So she emailed me yesterday and said, it worked. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, and see, I, I use this, again, I use this with my students as a homework assignment. I can't tell you the stuff I get, <laughs> you know? I healed relationships with my boyfriend. I got my kids to do their chores. <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> That's huge. Absolutely, right? That's huge. <laughs> That's bigger than getting through a divorce. You get your kids to do their chores. <laughs> From your perspective. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I just get, I have them. So I have them do this three times, and I have them write back what happened. What you experience, you know, da, 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 da. did it work for you? What didn't work? That kind of stuff. And the stories I get back are just juicy, you know, great stuff. So it's working again. I'm running through probably 1,500 students at least, and I'm just getting nothing but positive feedback from this. Now there are people who. One of the things you want to do is do, plan this out ahead of time, so you know when you get the situation, you know what's going to come up, and you know what your new thinking is going to be. Because when you get in the situation without a plan, you tend to get gripped. And then this mm -hmm. this owns you. Yeah? It's a matter of are you going to react or are you going to act on it? Yeah. And, or choose how to respond. Right. right? That's the Stephen Covey thing. Right. Animals get a stimulus, they react. Somewhere between stimulus and reaction, we can choose how to respond. That's the Viktor Frankl stuff. You guys familiar with Viktor Frankl? So, uh, Austrian psychiatrist got put in Auschwitz, World War II, was there five years, and beaten, starved, um, everything. Mother, father, brother, and sister were burned in the ovens. And he had, the one thing he came out with, was there was one liberty his captors could not take away from him. And that was his ability to choose to respond to the situation. He started a whole branch of, of responsible psychotherapy off of that whole thing. Choose how to respond to the situation. So is our kid not doing their chore? Or are you in a four by four foot box in Auschwitz? <laughs> that pales in comparison, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the stuff, again, this, okay, this is the kind of training you can do to build on top of your foundation for collaboration, to give people skill sets yeah, around dealing with themselves, which is the only thing they have influence over. You guys are familiar with the circle of influence, circle of concern? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you guys? Yeah. Good. Yeah, so this is, our, this is the stuff that's in our circle of influence. Here's the cool part. I've been doing this, I've been working this puppy for a little over a year now. And um, about six, eight weeks ago, I uh, decided I was going to work on self-doubt and fear. And it was like, <laughs> so this, and this stuff is akin to shadow work, if you're familiar with uh, Jung's stuff, the shadow part of yourself, you can't see all that kind of stuff. Well, the fears of false evidence appearing real. So when I said, I'm going to start working on self-doubts um, and fears, um, it was like, I opened this door, and it was pretty well lit, and there's all these fears in there, but they're little. They're only about this big. I go, oh. <laughs> That's a fear of I'm not going to get it done on time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got to do something else, mm -hmm. you know, and go choose new thinking kind of stuff. Isn't that fun? So it gets to be fun. This actually gets to be fun, right? It's not a big hairy deal anymore. It's like this is fun. Ah, <laughs> look at that. There's an impatience and irritation. Yeah, yeah. See you later. Well, here's the other cool thing: is because we're so uh, wired up, if you start working on impatience and irritation. In one arena, it re trickles over to other arenas. So I've been on a plane in five years. I'm getting on there. Oh God, you know the TSA is going to probe me, and you know I'm going to do all this stuff. And uh, get up there. These guys are gracious. They got a sense of humor. Well, what's going on here? I'm getting on the plane, disembark, right? And everybody stands up and waits for 40 minutes after the plane has <laughs> stopped. <laughs> Which I used to just see, right? And I was like, you want, you want some help to get that bag down there? I was like, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm patient with the checkers at Walmart. I'm going, what's going on here? But because I've worked on one area of impatience and irritation, it had rippled around mm -hmm. to others. So, yeah, so in the self doubts and fear, he starts, you know, sensing when the fear starts to come up before it ever gets a chance to grip you. Oh. That's just the fear. 
you know, fun stuff. Anyway, so I thought I'd throw that in. But this gives you, so I kind of rambled here, but all these kinds of things, and you can just keep training. This is ongoing professional development, right? Is once you build that foundation for collaboration, and we get it wired into our culture, then it's just learn, 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 and do, and skill, 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 around whatever that might be. I'm going to a one day workshop in Lacey. Um, I should send this to you guys. Yeah. On send it all to me off. Yeah. Send it out. This is kind of, this is cool, and it's just a long, totally congruent with this stuff here. She's a big old giant title, but basically, um, how to control your executive fun functions, your emotions, and your soft skills. Using soft skills, and a workshop on that, and it was so popular they did it a couple months ago. They're doing another one, um, September eighteenth. Send Sean that uh, emotional skills, soft skills uh, workshop. Where is it being held? It's in Lacey at St. Placid Priory. So it's a nunnery. Hmm. Get thee to a punnery. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it just it looks exciting as heck. I mean, mm -hmm. I dread the drive down and the drive back, but um, it looks it looks really really good. So more, that's the other thing. Well. Let me tell you, so in December, I went to five days of training on how to deliver a one-day training to businesses called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One, or uh, what's the other tagline is, um, Growth and Consciousness in Businesses and Organizations kind of stuff. So it was a one day, actually, a uh, week from Thursday, I go do practice session number three with uh, Mount Vernon Chamber. I've done two practice sessions so far. There's slides, and you got basically it's a facilitated thing. It's not that I'm a brain scientist. I'm just sharing the information and some of the examples, and da 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 da. And really, just being a facilitator for the program, breaking the habit of being yourself, how to lose your mind and create a new one. And this is. Have you guys? Any of you guys been to Landmark Forum? No. Okay. Not relevant then. Anyway, I went to a bunch. Of, I went to. The forum, the advanced course, the self-expression and leadership 16-week program. I coached the self-expression leadership program for 16 weeks. I went to the direct access brain, brain one. I get this guy's book a year ago, February. I go, oh my God, all the stuff that was in the forum stuff is in this book. Yeah, I went to his workshop a year ago, June, and I went to him and I said, are you a landmark forum graduate? He said, no, but I worked with Werner Earhart in the 80s. Werner Earhart's the guy that started the forum and all that stuff. So he took it and morphed into a whole different direction. So for 25 bucks, <laughs> yeah, I, know, wow. <laughs> I had all the information I needed. Is that what that book's called? The Breaking Habit? Yeah, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Mm -hmm. How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One. And that's where that uh, video I was talking about, the mirror neurons, and another um, video he's got. But what he does, so here's the cool part about the brain science stuff is none of, none of these brain scientists are arguing with each other, which is unusual, right? Um, in fact, one of the things that Joe Dispenza did, Dr. Joe, um, was he brought in a brain scientist that did, see if I can say this, quantitative electroencephalograms for people. So put a skull cap on with electrodes and maps their brain before, at, during, and after the workshops that Dr. Joe does. And one of the things he does is he does meditations, and you can get there's guided meditations. And what all it really is is ahead of time, you've decided just like this little model here, what it is you don't want to do anymore in patience and irritation. Decide what kind of new thinking or new vision you might have for yourself. Okay, it's ahead of time. And in the meditative guide, it gets you into the alpha state of the brain, which is just above theta, which is like half awake, half asleep, and then delta is sleeping. You get into an alpha state, and then says, has you identify what the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors were, notice and name, right? Thoughts, feelings, and behavior that aren't working for you anymore. So this isn't good or bad, is it working for you? And then has you identify that three different times, and then has you go in and talk, uh, think about your new thinking, whatever that might be, 
three different times. So you're setting this aside, you don't use it, you lose it. You're wiring this in, so you're wiring in a new neural network. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's very congruent with this little model that I, that I found before I ever even went to the Landmark Forum, right? Um, so I've been using that for quite a while, but it's totally congruent. So and I was like, wow, and it just keeps on going. So it's really cool because, I mean, this is the source of, this, this is the source of discrimination, prejudices, uh, good and bad thinking, anger, uh, people fighting each other over property lines, uh, people doing massively good deeds for other people. That kind of, all that stuff is coming out of here. Well, if you have access to it now, it's like, wow, how cool is that? So yeah, so in the meditations, and I don't even meditate that often, maybe once a week, but they're powerful because you get to really visibly, internally identify what it is that ain't working and visibly visualize what it is you want to have happen. And so working on different stuff, it's like, again, it gets to be fun, you know? It's not even like work anymore. <laughs> anyway, what else? Anything else? A lot of information? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got to go, I'm sorry, I got to go in uh, June, no July, to Denver to do co two days of coaching training on how to reinforce this change with folks. So if we do the one day workshop, you guys know what that's like, right? We got all excited and we go back to the office and put it on the top of the file cabinet, back to the same old grind. <laughs> so how do you, how do you coach somebody to keep this sustainable, back to the sustainable piece, right? How do you coach them to, to keep at it and keep going? That's one of the things, that, as a trainer, things I've observed for a long, long time is you can train all day long, all year long. Make it stick. Make it last. This is the toughest part. So I started building in reinforcement mechanisms. Call me once a week. We have a coaching call once a week. We're going to bring this up in every meeting, whatever the me mechanism is, have some way to keep it alive over time or it'll get dropped. That's what us human beings do. Why? Because we're 95% automatically doing whatever. Well, guess what we do back at work? That's all automatic, right? So changing is huge. Yeah. So, Buddhist monk goes up to the hot dog stand. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and says and says, make me one with everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the hot dog vendor makes him a hot dog with everything, hands it to him. The monk gives him a twenty dollar bill, and the hot dog guy doesn't give him any change back. The monk says, well, "Where's my chains?" I guess his change must come from within. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs>